world. And as Paul defends his ministry, beginning at verse 1 in chapter 10, he moves beyond the immediate circumstances and he begins to describe the work of the local church in cosmic universal proportions. It's kind of extraordinary what he does. It's more or less saying, you know, well, this is just a little congregation right here. The church in Corinth was probably even smaller than our Sunday school class today. But he realized what was going on there had implications far greater. And so it is this morning. What we're doing right here, we should not forget, is part of the universal church's ministry. And what we do here through our prayers, through our teaching, through our discipleship, through our ministry, our worship, we are somehow impacting the entire work that God is doing. There is a universal connection, the church. And we can see that as Paul is very specific and then begins to speak about his ministry. So let's hear now as I read beginning at verse 1 of chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, and I'll read on through verse 6. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. And we pause for a moment. We say, wow, this is a personal wrangling going on with the local church, isn't it? They're fighting. But notice what he goes on from this point. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Paul moves from this immediate context to, if you will, the cosmic battlefield of the kingdom of God. And we're part of that battle right now. And so as we read this text, as we think about it, we want to say, yes, we are at war. And let's contemplate what that war looks like. Now, as we think about it, first of all, let's consider the fact of some of the things that uh, would indicate that there is a war going on. I'm just saying some of the things that I've observed uh, in American culture in my lifetime. Not that America has ever been identifiable with the kingdom of God, but it is clear that the gospel has been a part of the American experience with churches being a critical part of our society. But think about this. The explosion of divorce, school prayer and scripture reading forbidden. American history has been entirely revised, so the area that I delight in, the founding of America, has been expunged from many school curricula. It's amazing. Uh, the sexual revolution has come along. Abortion on demand legalized. Uh, there's been the normalization of uh, same-sex relationships. Then there's been a second sexual revolution. We can't even keep up with all the initials. When I put this up, it only had this many, LGBTQ, but they have added more. And I'm not even sure what the next one stand for. We've seen the erosion of First Amendment protections for the church where the church was once honored and delighted in the community. It's now viewed as a liability, and there are even areas that are zoned as church-free in some places. What else? The new atheism is being celebrated. We know of names like Richard Dawkins, who goes around emphasizing how God is irrelevant. We've heard arguments like religion poisons everything. God is not great. Cultural Marxism a new form of the ideology of secular materialism that wants a revolution of the classic model of Western civilization. Most recently, the redefinition of gender, a gender that can be fluid, that can change day to day, moment by moment. It's amazing. These are the things that are going on. Now, we might talk about those as liberal and conservative today. Those are not the issues. They're manifestations of the issue. As we continue to think about it, let's think about the fact what Paul has said. We're at war, but our enemies are not human. Okay, let's stop for a moment and let that sink in. 
The conflicts that we all experience, whatever our politics may or may not be, whatever our view of our culture, whatever our view of church relations, whatever our view of family, of uh, inner struggles in a congregation and beyond, these are not our enemies. Paul says very clearly, for though we walk in the flesh, and now in this point when Paul uses walking in the flesh, he's not using it in that pejorative sense, where in the flesh means you're walking in rebellion to God only for this world. He's saying, though we walk like, like human beings, we're just human beings after all, Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Paul says we have a war, but our war is not against human beings. Our war is against something far more nefarious, far more powerful, far more difficult to identify. It is, in fact, what we read about in Ephesians chapter 6, which we could see as a parallel text. That passage says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Paul argues that there is a spiritual warfare that is being touched every time a Christian begins to worship and pray, and it is not another human being. It is what's behind the entire cosmic system of a world that's in rebellion to the Creator and the Redeemer. Our enemies are the powers of spiritual darkness. As I think about that language of spiritual darkness, uh, a couple of pictures come to mind. Perhaps you remember the classic parable of the Valley of the Blind. If you've never heard it, it's good. If you've heard it, it's worth retelling. The idea is that once there was a man who was exploring and he went into an area that was essentially untouched. And when he got there, he discovered that everyone in this Entire valley was blind. They did not have the normal gift of sight. Blindness was normative. And when he came into that, he was taken as an extraordinary figure. They said, you mean you can see? What is seeing? And he would demonstrate that he could do things that the blind could not do. He could anticipate things far away that they could not see. And they began to appreciate him. And as he wrestled in this culture, they finally said to him, we really appreciate your coming here, but you know, we're beginning to be concerned about all these things you tell us about seeing. It makes us uncomfortable. It's something good, but it's dangerous. If you really want to stay with us, we ask that you would pluck your eyes out. Just put that out of your life, and then you're welcome. You can stay with us. You say, well, did he pluck out his eyes? Well, most of us say, well, no one would do that. But let's put ourselves as we as believers go out into the broader culture wherever we are. We are walking into the valley of the spiritual blind. They see what we offer, our gifts, our talents, our personal abilities, the way we operate. And they say, these are half, actually halfway decent people. But you know what? If you really want to become part of us, stop talking about this Jesus. Stop quoting the Bible. Stop talking about eternity. Nobody can really see those things. Those are just fairy tales. Those are just dreams. Just pluck out your spiritual eyes and you can be one with us. That's where the battle is being fought. The spiritual blindness that wants to take out the light that shines in the heart of the believer. That is where we feel the cosmic battle every day. You mean you're going to try to live like a Christian here? You can't do that. Now, as you think about it, uh, consider the response to darkness or blindness. I recently sent out a letter. I, you know, I'm, I'm a fundraiser. I don't pass an offering plate here, but if Dan let me, I would say, all gifts today, put them in for Westminster Seminary. That's kind of a little hint there, you know, but we'll let you decide what to do with that. I'm supposed to raise money for a school. It's a good cause, right? And I sent out a letter, a fundraising letter to the folks on it, and you know what the title was? It says, help us keep the lights on. Because when you keep the lights on, you're sending out missionaries that are bringing the light of the gospel to dark places in the world. I've yet to see a letter that's sent by 
a nonprofit organization that says, uh, help us keep the lights off. We don't want the lights on. You want light. If we turned off the lights, you'd say, man, what, I can't see. Seeing is important. We don't have, help us keep our campus dark. No, we want to see the light. Christians, as we begin the description of the war that we're facing, it is not against people. It's not against nations. It's against spiritual forces that want to blind our eyes, even if the God of this world has darkened and blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. So we read, for example, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded their eyes. So you recognize this classic image of Paul when he talks about the weapons. Paul will say in the passage we've just read, thus our weapons have to have divine power. They don't have to have the ability to harm people in their flesh and blood or in their mobilities in this world. That's not the weapons or the battle that we're fighting. The battle that we're fighting is the spiritual battle of light and darkness, of belief and unbelief, of eternity and destinies. And so we begin to think about, for our weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power. And so if we borrow again from a parallel passage, Ephesians 6, we think about this classic image of Paul as he considered the Roman guard that often uh, he had to walk by or actually was uh, held in prison by. He knew exactly what a Roman soldier looked like. And so he goes through them. He talks about the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God in prayer. That is keeping alert and persevering, as he will say. As we look at each of those weapons, we realize they especially touch the spiritual unseen realm. We ask the question, well, what is ultimately true? Is there a God or not? Is the Bible trustworthy or not? Do men have souls that will never die or not? Is there a word from God that has been revealed to us or not? Righteousness. Is there really such a thing as being right with God and being under God's judgment for being sinful? You think again, how about the gospel of peace? The gospel, the good news. Did Christ really die on the cross for sinners to satisfy the wrath of God? Is it really true that Jesus rose from the dead to give us life? The gospel, does that bring peace with God? How important is faith? Is faith to be defined as believing something you know isn't true? Or is faith believing something that's absolutely true, that's unknowable in any other way because it can only be received by divine revelation? Is faith folly? Or is faith the power of God unto salvation? About what is salvation? R.C. Sproul, you know, the great Reformed Bible teacher, just passed away. But I still remember his extraordinary insight when he said, do we believe in salvation? Of course. Well, what are we being saved from? And he put it in the most memorable ways. God is saving us from God. It is a holy God who in grace is saving us from his holiness. The judgment of God against sin is God's wrath. And God is rescuing us. Is that true? That is the spiritual issue. Light and darkness. That is our... Our struggle, the unbelief that would say there is no salvation. If there is a salvation, it's the redistribution of wealth. Or it is let everyone have their own form of pleasure in this world. That's what salvation is. Or is salvation something with light and darkness? Is the Bible the sword of the Spirit? Did God reveal it? How about this? Prayer. Does prayer matter? When we pray, is someone hearing our prayers? Or is prayer just a waste of time? The deist who said maybe there's a first cause in the universe rejected the value of prayer. There's no God who hears us. There may be a God, but he doesn't care. Okay. These are the weapons that Paul identifies. They are the panoply. 
the full range of weapons that are given to the believer in this spiritual warfare. We continue on as we think about what Paul is saying here. Notice how we might begin to distinguish this whole armor of God, this full range. I thought about them and I said, you know, they kind of fall into two categories that might help us as we begin to think about the arena of apologetics, of our defending our faith in a context of a spiritual war against darkness. On the left-hand side, we can see what we call general revelation. General revelation is that which God manifests to us in the world just by being in his creation. It is generally available to all. It is God unveiling himself, and it's something that is accessible to everyone everywhere. Whether they see it or not, it is here. Now, special revelation is that unique way in which God unveils himself that is only available through the means of Christ incarnate, the incarnation, or through the Spirit's inspiration of the written word of God. Special revelation. We see the balance. Both are part of what the scriptures teach us. The heavens declare the glory of God. Thus says the Lord. Both are revelation. One is available to all, the other is available to only those who receive and have this message. Now, in general revelation, I would say part of our panoply, part of our weaponry, includes truth. Truth is something that no one can evade. Now, you've heard in this postmodern world, one of its great tenets is there is no truth. And you know what the proper response is? Is that true? For the argument to be true, there has to be truth. But there is no truth, which means it's eviscerated the moment it's spoken. Isn't that amazing? It sounds so brilliant, but soon you discover it has no bear. That's a general revelation argument. How about this, a breastplate of righteousness? Are things right and are things wrong? No, there's no right or wrong. It's all just personal opinion. Well, you steal somebody's uh, bank account and see if they say, well, there's no really right or wrong. You'll find out what they think real fast. Well, that's wrong. Well, I thought there's no right or wrong. Okay. Uh, These are the emphases of how we begin to engage the fact that those that are living in darkness cannot evade, that there's something bigger than what they're dealing with. Now, we know that's not enough because Romans 1 will say that what we know We can suppress. We can hold down. We can become willingly self-deceived. We can deny that which is here. But God has continued to give us special revelation. And that's part of how we defend the faith. Christians should not be afraid to say, now you may not agree with me. You may think it's foolish. But this is what I believe and this is what the scriptures say. You have to have the courage to proclaim the gospel of peace and the need for faith unto salvation as taught by the word of God and received through prayer. We have general and special revelation that's part of our weapons that are spiritual in nature. Now, you notice as we go on, as we read the text we've just looked at, Paul will go on to say our objective is to destroy. Did you know that your business as a believer is to destroy? Oh, yeah, that doesn't sound very loving. It is. Aren't you glad that you go to the doctor and he seeks to destroy the cancer cells that want to destroy you? Aren't you glad when you go to the pharmacy, he gives you some antibiotics that seek to destroy those living organisms that are trying to give you pneumonia and kill you? This is a battle. We are seeking to destroy things that are destroying the souls of men. It's not people. Our war is not against, it's against spiritual powers that impact the mind and the heart of people. So I like to, uh, because I, as you know, I I work with a group called the Providence Forum. We try to bring in some of the spiritual messages of Americas. So let me just give a quick rabbit trail. This is, for those of you who love history, you'll enjoy this. For those of you who don't, this is your moment to nod off and I'll wake you up, okay? 
I learned long ago that a nodding audience doesn't always mean agreement. Okay. Now, have you ever seen that image right there? <clears throat> Be honest. How many of you have ever seen that? Raise your hand before this. Okay. At least one or two hands. Do you know what it is? Does it ring a bell? That's the Army flag. Anybody here ever served in the Army? Okay, a few hands. Isn't that amazing? You've been in the Army, but the flag is there, but no one's ever bothered to point it out to you. Okay, now it looks, you can say, okay, what is that? Well, there's a, a suit of armor. You can see flags. You can see a spear and a bayonet. And then you see this, what in the world is that in the middle? It looks like they're going skiing or something, a stocking cap. Now, that's called a liberty pole and cap. That was an early symbol of freedom. Now, how did that come about? Quick story. There was a general by the name of Suetonius who came into Phrygia in the early time of the Roman Empire. And he, as he came into this town, he took his battle lance and he took off a pileus. That was a hat of a freed slave. He put it on his pole and he lifted it up. And he said, any man who stands under this pole and cap will be free. Basically what he was saying to the slaves, stand with us and you're going to be a free man. Join our forces and you will be free. And so it becomes a classic symbol of freedom. Our founding fathers used it. Paul Revere used to use this in his etchings in their newspapers in Boston in the American Revolutionary Era. We've kind of lost sight of it. It's equivalent, if you didn't have a big tree called the Liberty Tree where the Sons of Liberty would meet, they would put up a pole and cap, the Liberty Pole and Cap. Okay, so that's it. Now above that, do you see what's above there, above the pole and cap? Looks like a snake, doesn't it? Okay, and it says, this we'll defend. So now because we're good exegetes, the this has to be defined by context, right? Pastor Dan has taught you that for years as you're studying. Okay, what, this has to, what's the context? The this is that pole and cap. It's right above liberty. A rattlesnake. Okay, the rattlesnake is defending liberty. Why in the world is that? Okay, well, this is well, Philadelphia now. They're really freezing in the cold. They're, they may not be rattlesnaking, but they're rattling up there, rattling cold. It's uh, like one degree or something. My wife is really angry that I'm down here in 60 degrees <laughs> Dallas. So you got to pray for me when I go home. It's going to be it's going to be an icy welcome in more than one way when I go back. Okay. So at any rate, uh, as as you look at this, you say, why? Well, Franklin said it this way: the rattlesnake should be the symbol of the American army. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's a North American snake, so it fits us. I mean, they're they're Rattlesnakes in Texas, right? Yeah. Okay. Number, number two, it never blinks. It doesn't have eyelids, so it can't blink, right? Okay. This is American snake symbolizing the army. The army should never blink, always watching. Thirdly, it never attacks unless provoked. We're, we're not about offensive wars, we're about defense. We will protect ourselves. We're not coming to harm people. Thirdly, we never attack without warning the rattle. Okay, you're going to mess with us. Guess what? I don't know whatever you think, but that whoever who has the biggest button on their desk, you know, that's kind of like rattling out there. That could be folly. I won't go into politics, but there it is. It's, if we're going to attack, get ready. You're, you're provoking us, rattling. And then finally... If it attacks, it kills. It destroys. Okay, wow, that, the American army. Well, guess what? We as Christians are also to realize we are to destroy. We are to attack the darkness. Not people. We are at war, and our purpose is to destroy that which stands against the light of the gospel. Paul says that's our mission. So, there's a little a parallel that might help it mine. So our objective is to destroy divine power to destroy strongholds. And so it's interesting that imagery is actually picked up in the Old Testament book of Proverbs. 
And there's a parallel if you look at the Greek and the Septuagint. Remember the Old Testament translation of Hebrew into Greek that was often used by our early uh, apostolic uh, leaders and early Christians? Proverbs 10, 29, there'll be similar words. It says, the way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. In other words, when we begin to live the Lord's way, it is a way of blessing. But by the very fact that we live this way, we are beginning to be a threat to the darkness. And that's why the world hates the Christian faith. Because what we do and what we stand for is not hatred. It's loving God. But by the very nature of seeking to please God, it's beginning to challenge the world system and saying, you know what, you're on the wrong path. There is an eternity. There is a God. There are consequences for your actions. And they want to suppress that. We are reminding them of something. The very way of living God. John Bunyan put it this way. The same sun that hardens clay softens wax. The word of God softens our hearts. It hardens the hearts of those that are in rebellion to God. We're just living for God. Our very lives are seeking to destroy the works of the evil one as we live for God. Another passage, Proverbs 21, 22. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. You know what the greatest assault against the darkness of our day is? It's simply the wisdom of God. When we live with God's wisdom, the folly of the world begins to be exposed. You know, we could, if we had time, we could retell that story of the emperor has no clothes. Do you remember who said those powerful words? A child. Out of the mouth of children comes forth wisdom. There's wisdom that God's word gives. And God has provided it for us. And when we live it, when we teach it, just by being who we are, that's the nature of light. When light begins to shine, what happens to darkness? It has to recede. Just by being who we are, believing what we are, it begins to make an impact. Light dispels darkness. Okay, got to watch my time here. Okay, our objective is to destroy. Okay, we've talked a little bit about this, but here's a, a, maybe a few good illustrations to conclude since our time is up. I always have more than I can fit in. It, I, I love that quote by Spurgeon. I know I go long, but you would be amazed at how much I'm holding back. <laughs> I have so much more I want. Well, you got to bring me back next year, and I'll keep going, Dan. I don't know. We'll see what happens. All right, but we've already said, when someone tells you there's no truth, just remember to say, is that true? There, there, there's, no, there's no retort to that. It's you're being hung on your own petard right at that point, right? How about this? There is no right to property. That's, that's one of the things we'll hear in a drive toward a radical equality of property, a radical Marxist socialism that's invading everything in the West. Capitalism is evil. Private property is wrong. Okay, thou shalt not steal is meaningless. We own everything and it should be redistributed. And that's why I love this story of a communist who is at Speaker's Corner at Hyde Park. Maybe you've ever been to London and gone to that place where you, that you're allowed to get up on your soapbox and say whatever you want. And there was a, a, a Marxist communist who got up and began to expound a, a group of people assembled. And he began to explain how he thought that private property was absolutely foolish. It was immoral. Everything had to be taken from everyone, redistributed, so everybody would have the same. And then we would begin to have a just society. And so after several minutes of pontificating, he got down and he went and said, Who stole my bicycle? Don't you know I rode 20 miles to get here? Touché. Thou shalt not steal somehow it has value, doesn't it? We cannot run from righteousness, from right and wrong. We cannot run from truth. It is part of the very fabric of the universe. It's just like we cannot escape the atmosphere. We cannot escape the terra firma. Sooner or later, we have to take them into account. And so uh, one of the 
classic examples of apologetics uh, that I remember several years ago I had the chance when uh, Hong Kong was still totally independent from China. And so I was there in Hong Kong. I was given the chance to go into China to visit. And they gave me a young uh, North Korean student studying. He was an atheist. In North, he knew English. He was studying English. And they figured he, they, he could be a good tour guide for an American. And uh, it was my chance to see you know, places in Beijing. It was hard to get in back then, and I got the chance. So I went. And as we were walking along, he wanted to know who I was. And I told him, well, I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm a Christian. And we were talking back and forth about atheism and communism and the history of China and all the different things. And then finally, after a while, he said to me, you know what, Professor Lilbeck, I want you to know something. I could never become a Christian. I said, why? He said, because it's so Western. I said, wow, that's an interesting point. I said, are, are you a Marxist? Of course. I said, do you know that Marx was from Germany and he's buried in England? And Jesus was from the ancient Near East? You know, Jesus is more Eastern than Marx? He said, oh, man, I never thought of that before. And, you know, that's the point, that things, we all are subject to the deceptions of our culture. And one of the things the Bible lets us do is to begin to speak truth about things that people have never heard. Don't be afraid to just say what is true about the Bible because it will pierce a bubble. Uh, I love the uh, story that Dr. Kennedy once told. He said he was on a uh, major evening news talk show in a large southern city. And uh, as he was there being interviewed by the, the host of the program, a lady who was doing it, known for quite an effective uh, way of getting messages out, she was talking to Dr. Kennedy, and after a while she said, now, Dr. Kennedy, if you were to stand before Jesus today, and he said, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? He looked and said, you know, that's one of Dr. Kennedy's great questions from Evangelism Explosion. So he shares the gospel. She said, now let me ask you another question. Suppose someone was going to die tonight. Can they really know if they're going to go to heaven? That's the other question, Dr. Kennedy. And so here he is. He's preaching the gospel on this secular talk show. And after it's all done, he looks at her and says, how in the world did you get away with that? She said, do you see that man over there? Yeah. Well, he's our station manager. I led him to Christ three years ago, and he lets me do whatever I want. <laughs> That's the power of the gospel. It causes us to lay down our weapons before the things of God. His unbelief was destroyed, and the gospel came out. That's why the gospel is always the power of God unto salvation. It is our weapon par excellence. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. That will be part of the sermon today. Okay, C.S. Lewis put it this way. You remember, he was an atheist. He said, I was the most reluctant convert that night in all of England. But the great deer slayer took aim and shot his arrow of grace into my heart. And I was dragged kicking and shouting into the kingdom of God. Now, many of us here believe in Reformed theology. That's the beauty of God's sovereign work. When his word is taught, when God chooses to impart his spirit, even atheists fall, rebels fall, and they are drawn into the kingdom of God. That's why we're about destroying the enemy with the gospel. Now, as we wrap up, our time is nearly done here. Um, I wanted to say a quick word. I'll try to do this in two minutes about where it says, we destroy strongholds by a holistic response to non-Christian worldviews. Verse 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Okay, uh, so one of my favorite examples, uh, my book, people have mentioned George Washington's Sacred Fire. It's really hard to call uh, George Washington a, a deist after you've read everything he ever said about deism and he's attacking it. You know, that's part of how you bring down a lofty opinion by just the facts. C.S. Lewis said, no clever arrangement of bad eggs will make a good omelet. But my favorite story of lofty opinions, 
Okay, we've already mentioned Dawkins. Remember the great atheists going around talking about how evolution explains everything? Well, here, he made an attack on the uh, Archbishop of England. It went something like this. He said, you know, a study has been done, and most of the people who call themselves Christians in your church, your highness archbishop, I don't know what they called him, but, you know, a respectful title, they can't even mention the names of the four Gospels. How can you call them Christians when they can't even say what are the names of the four Gospels? <clears throat> now, that's, that's something to be sad about, right? But very interestingly, the archbishop said, now, uh, Professor Dawkins, you claim to be an evolutionist, is that correct? Of course. So that means you follow uh, Charles Darwin? Yes. Well, can you tell me the name of his book? He said, um, yes, The Origin of the Species. He said, no, that's not the name of the book. Can you actually tell me the name of the book? He says, well, it's, it is longer than that. What's it? It's, um, 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 oh, um, um, uh, it's, um, mm. and then he finally says, oh, my God. And it's, Ravi Zacharias was actually there watching. He said, isn't it amazing? An atheist finally was forced to appeal to God. Okay. In case you're wondering what it is, okay, there it is. On the origin of species by means of natural selection for the preservation of favored races and the struggle for life. Okay. Part of what God is calling on us to do is to develop the skill to be able to answer the hard questions people bring us and bring them to the place of humility before God. We can't ultimately do it, but apologetics has its role. So as we wrap up, because we must conclude, the gospel is serious business. And what we've said today is every local congregation, just like Corinth, when it begins its work, moves from its immediate business to the cosmic battle and we are at war. That war is not against other human beings. That war is against the spiritual darkness. And God has given us extraordinary weapons of truth and righteousness, general revelation, plus all the blessings of the gospel and God's word. And we should be bold to share them, knowing that in God's time and God's way, we will see people converted. They will be changed. So be bold in the witness, but realize our goal is through the preaching and teaching of the gospel to destroy the strongholds and lofty opinions that stand against Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, as we reflect on your word that you will help us to be warriors in the battle of the kingdom, that we'd love our enemies, that we do good to those around us. May we speak the truth in love. But Lord, we pray that your truth would go forth with the might and power that will bring those that you've called and chosen as your own to yourself. May we be faithful in our service for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.